So space can act like a lens. It's an interesting observation, but Einstein said it was so unimportant it would never be observed. This is the calculation he did in 1936 in his notebook. It's not a complex calculation. But the point is, he thought it was so unimportant that he'd forgotten. If you go to his notebooks in 1912, you can find exactly the same calculation. He did it in 1912. He just forgot he did it because it said it would never be important, never be. And, 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 and in fact, one of my favorite parts of this little history of science is the letter he wrote to the editor of Nature afterwards, or Science afterwards, where he said, let me also thank you for your cooperation with the little publication which Mr. Mandel squeezed out of me. It is of little value, but it makes the poor guy happy. <laughs> so that's how science is done, okay? The, the really amazing thing about this picture is that every point in this picture is a galaxy, not a star. And, that, and, and this cluster of galaxies is a conglomeration of galaxies. Almost all galaxies live in clusters. They're the biggest bound objects in the universe, about 10 million light years across this picture. But this cluster is 5 billion light years away. Okay? That means the light left these stars before our Earth and Sun formed. The Earth and Sun are about 4.5 billion years old. So the, the light left before our, the Earth was even around uh, to, to capture the light. Five billion, light, five billion years later. And the other thing is that each of these galaxies contains hundreds of billions of stars five billion years ago. So, and if there are stars like our sun, then most of them have burned out. So you can imagine there are civilizations living on those galaxies in those, in those, around those stars that are long gone. They'll never, we'll never know about them. And there could be thousands of them in this image. We don't know. It's really kind of, to me, I find that inspirational. That aspect, of, every time I look at a picture like this, it causes me to think about things like that that I would never think about otherwise. That's why we need to keep looking at the universe, because it inspires us in a way that obviously myth and superstition don't. But in any case, this bound cluster, uh, is, well, there's some obvious, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that there are images here that are different than the others. They're blue things. Those blue things look different than the other galaxies. And what those blue things are, are multiple images of a single galaxy located 5 billion light years behind the cluster, 10 billion light years away from us. And we wouldn't even see that galaxy except for the fact that the space has magnified it and distorted it. Each of these is a different image of the same object. It's distorted it and produced multiple images just like that cut glass goblet. It's amazing proof that space is curved around objects, it's that space can act like a lens. So it's validation of that very fact that Einstein said would never be observable. We can now use it for something else. And we can, we can use it because we understand how mass curves space, and therefore we can use this image and ask how much mass is there in this system. We can weigh the system because we can ask, where would the mass have to be distributed and how much of it would there have to be to produce precisely the image you see? It's a very complicated mathematical inversion, but you can do it. And the first people to do it were Tony Tyson and colleagues at Bell Labs a while ago. It's a beautiful picture from the Hubble Space Telescope of a distant galaxy far, far away and long, long ago. And, uh, and there's a whole galaxy. It's about a billion light years away. We're looking at it as it looked a billion years ago. So, so many of those stars no longer exist. And here's an object that's just a, a, as bright as the whole center of the galaxy. You think it's a star that's near in our galaxy that just got caught in the picture frame. It's not. It's a star on the edge of that galaxy that has exploded. And exploding stars shine with the brightness of 10 billion stars. They're the brightest fireworks in the universe, supernovae. And they're remarkable. And I, I keep having asides. Maybe I'll get to my point eventually. But um, the... the um, this is something that, that, that I wrote a whole book about, and someone asked me yesterday why I wrote that book. Because it is the most poetic thing I know about the universe. Um, Richard wrote a great book called, our, uh, called, what's it called, Our Ancestors? What's it called? Ancestors' Tale, yes. I, I wanted to make sure I got that right. Uh, and, and I wrote a book that was a different Ancestors' Tale. It was called Adam. But the amazing thing is that every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution weren't created at the beginning of time. They're created in the nuclear furnaces of stars and the only way they can get into your body is if the stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus, the stars died so that you could be here today, okay? And, and anyway. The answer to is religion and compatible with science is clearly no, we could just go home. Um, uh, in the sense 
that the doctrines of the world's organized religions are incompatible with science. Um, every specific doctrine is known to be incompatible with the results of empirical evidence. I'm pl pleased to see the Catholic Church is um, progressing to want to agree with things, in which case they would agree that virgins don't give birth, um, that you don't bring people back from the dead, um, and if you want to go back further, the earth didn't stand still when you blew a trumpet, and lots of other aspects of, um, of doctrine. Now, most people who are practicing Catholics or otherwise, who are sensible, and I'll, I'll put you in that category. Um, just you wait. Uh, yeah, I'll just wait, okay, um, for the moment. Uh, what they do is, what, what people, people like religion, that's what people like. They like to religion. Why do they like religion? Because they like to feel like they're good people. In fact, my friend Richard Dawkins' foundation ran a, a, a census in England of the, of the people. Last census in England asked religion. And for the very first time, only slightly more than 50% of the people in England declared themselves uh, to be affiliated with the Church of England, 53%, which is great. It's going down. Um, but they asked those people why they, why they declared themselves. And they said, do you believe in transubstantiation? Do you believe in the virgin birth? Do you believe in this? And everyone, the answer was no, 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 no. And they said, why, why are you religious? And they, the answer was, I like to think of myself as a good person. Because religion has usurped that notion of morality. But clearly, the only way religion can be consistent with science is to get rid of all the doctrines on which religion is based. So, so arguing that something doesn't make sense to you is based on the fact that you, uh, the assumption that you know what's sensible in advance. But we don't know what's sensible in advance until we explore the world around us. Our common sense derived from the fact that we evolved on the savanna in Africa to avoid lions, not to understand quantum mechanics, for example. As I've often said, common sense, our, deductive, our deductions might suggest that you cannot be in two places at once. That is crazy. But of course, an electron not only can be, but it is. We, it doesn't make sense because we didn't evolve to know about it. We've learned about it. We force our idea of common sense to change. It's called learning. Some people would rather read an ancient book than learn. And with, this has been a very good evidence of that. For example, to say something is inconceivable just means you can't conceive it. But the great thing about the universe, and the reason that I do science, is that the universe has a much greater imagination than we do. In fact, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. And that's what's wonderful about the universe. Things that are inconceivable happen all the time. And what, we, what that does is that expands our mind. And expanding our minds to conform to the evidence of reality is common sense. The fact that there's this early connection between the origins of science and religion is historical. Interesting, but doesn't say anything about science. Moreover, the wonderful thing about children is they grow up. So the church is the mother of science. But the great thing about children is they grow up, and for, the even better thing for some children is they leave home. Parents here who are in that situation will, parents here who aren't in that situation will bemoan the fact that some children don't leave home. But Science originated in the only form of education there was, but it grew up. And, it, and then the questions that science asked progressed. The questions that religion asked didn't progress. Because the difference between science and religion is that we don't assume the answers before we ask the questions. We let nature tell us the answers. That doesn't mean I respect ideas. Okay, some ideas are ridiculous. And that's perfectly reasonable. In fact, ridiculing ideas is what makes progress. So if I offend some of you, I don't mean to offend you personally. I may offend some of your ideas, but I don't, that doesn't bother me at all. Just as if, just in fact, if you confront my ideas, um, it will lead to a discussion. Um, what does offend me, of course, is offending personal freedom and, and equal rights. And that's one of the reasons why I got upset at the beginning of this um, uh, session. But that's been fixed, and I thank the organizers for that as well, to agreeing to not segregate this room in the 21st century is a great step forward, and I appreciate that. Um, now, you know, I'm really shocked. First of all, all of the, I've watched 
uh, 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 Mr. Sources, right? Sources. My Greek is pretty good, I think. Be gorgeous. Yeah, gorgeous. Well, you are rather gorgeous. <laughs> gorgeous George over here. Um, uh, has all, I, I watched some of these, and they're always exactly the same. So I thought they'd be different this time. Um, and it always begins with you, and I'm supposed to respond to you. But the, and I will, to some extent, but it's hard to respond to nonsense. And in fact, the point of this is not is is not a question, does God exist? It's not, that's not the question. It's atheism or I Islam or atheism, uh, which is more sensible, I think, is what it says, or something like that. Now, I, I was just shocked because, because I thought that you wouldn't bother to try and pretend you knew science, because you don't, and we're gonna go through that in, in real detail. Everything you said is nonsense when it comes to science, so we'll go through, and we'll have a little chat, if that's okay. Of course. Okay, good. Um, and, and so I found it uh, remarkable that you began with that kind of nonsense, and we'll, we'll continue from that. But let me just first begin with the fact that the, um, that the premise of this debate is in some sense inappropriate, um, because it, it suggests two things. First of all, it suggests that Islam is something special, and it isn't. It's not special at all. It's one of a thousand religions that have been, or more that have existed since the dawn of humanity, all of which claim divine revelation, all of which claim perfection, all of which contain, uh, proclaim infinite knowledge, uniqueness, beauty, etc. So Islam is just a religion like any other religion. And there's no difference. It's, it's, it proclaims just as the Rig Veda did and Akhenaten in ancient Egypt that the universe had a beginning, nothing special, okay? It, there's, there's absolutely nothing special. So the question is, Islam as one of a thousand religions, all of which make the same claims, but mutually con inconsistent ones. So one of the things we know is, of these thousand religions, they all make mutually inconsistent claims, so they can't all be correct. In fact, at best, one of them can be correct, because they're not, they're not consistent with each other. So that means a priori, just a priori, and I know, you know like that, you like that term instead of a posteriori. I've heard you say that. A priori, Islam has a probability of 0.1% of being correct. Because it's just one of a thousand religions, and one of them is, it, 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 at most is correct. But since they all make the same claims, it's probable that none of them are correct. So, that's, so treating Islam specially is inappropriate. Then atheism is somehow, as has been described as speaker, a belief system. It's not a belief system like, like uh, Islam or Judaism or Christianity or the Norse myths or, 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 or Zeus or Thor or any of the other uh, myths that have been created throughout human history. It's all it's saying is, it's not a belief system. It's saying, you know what? We don't choose to believe that stuff because there's, it's not sensible. So it's not saying we believe X. It's saying well, this, this myth is inconsistent with this myth, or this myth is inconsistent with what we know about the universe, and therefore, it's unlikely to be true. So what atheism is, is just saying, this is unlikely to be true. It's not a belief system. So to compare one versus the other is, of course, false. It's a false premise. So for, I really, I come here not to bury God, but to praise honesty, full disclosure, and skeptical empirical inquiry, which alas, are bearing God. And, but that's the key thing I want to talk about. And, and so before I, since I believe in full disclosure, I thought I'd give some full disclosure, which is my biases. What really matters to me is the ethics of science, open questioning, the fact that there are no scientific authorities, that we believe in honesty, transparency, reliance on evidence, peer review, and testability. All of these, I believe, make the world a better place. And they do so specifically by bearing myth and superstition and dogma. Now here's, a, here's an idea of why common sense should tell you that Islam, like many other religions, is not common sense. Because of course homosexuality is perfectly natural. In all, in all animal species almost it's natural. It occurs with a 10% frequency. Okay? In fact, there are good evolutionary reasons for homosexuality. So in that sense, there's no reason and a fundamental, why would a god who thought it was a sin make it natural among all species? I don't think the sheep, by the way, which 10% of sheep are long-term homosexual relationships, okay? <laughs> why would a god who thought it was a sin create sheep who don't have a soul, who, can't, who aren't able to think about it, be homosexual? 
That's the kind of nonsense that we have to ask. And the only way we can determine if it's nonsense is by looking at the world around us, not by deducing it, not by listening to the words of ignorant individuals and Iron Age, Iron Age peasants who didn't even know the Earth orbited the sun. Wisdom and learning comes from observing the world around us. And we shouldn't take our wisdom from people who didn't even understand the way the world worked. Thank you. Can a scientist believe in God and still be a functioning scientist? A absolutely. There, there, are, there are functioning scientists and, and who, who can believe in God. There are functioning scientists who are pedophiles. There are functioning scientists who are... <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean, the point is, scientists are human. Well, 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 we but that, not... was a, that, was a, that was a very, very, very rough grouping that you just did. <laughs> well, in the Catholic Church, it's not so different, but... but uh, um... I don't know. I don't know in the spirit of this thing if you want to step back from that. <laughs> okay, but what, yeah, okay, but what I want to point out is that people can believe, people are not fully rational. The point is that no, people I'm asking, can believe... The question people, is, can you be a good scientist and believe in God? As long or, as you don't or, take the God into the laboratory. As a very famous biologist said, when I go into the laboratory, I become an atheist. Because when I believe, when I twiddle the knobs in my experiment, I don't believe there's some, some angel affecting the results of the experiment. And if I believe that in the laboratory, why should I believe it outside? Some people choose to believe it outside, the minute they take it into the laboratory, they stop being good scientists. But the Islamic God, much like the Judeo-Christian God, is a real creep. This is a God worse than Saddam Hussein. Instead of tor torturing you just for your life, tortures you for infinity, forgive me the word, but eternity, let me use that word. Eternity for not believing. For not believing, you're tortured for Infinity. The tortures are actually described in the Quran, and you know it as well as I do. And the point is, if you just ask yourself common sense, if you were a divine being, say you had an ant colony that you made in your house, would you be offended if those ants didn't pay homage to you five? Well, let's start with 50 times a day before Muhammad cut it down to 30 and then five. Would you be offended if those ants didn't pay homage to you five times a day? And if they didn't, if they didn't look up to you or didn't recognize your existence, would you destroy them? No, I mean, it just seems so petty. So why should we believe in a hateful, unmerciful, petty, sadomasochistic, homophobic, sexist God? It's just irrational. It's not sensible. Human civilization began by putting purpose and, and, and intelligent purpose behind gods associated with the sun, the moon, the planets, the wind, the earth, the oceans. There, it's been by one estimate over a thousand different gods throughout human history. Mars, God of War, Poseidon, Thor, all the rest. And the really important thing is that all of you, or almost all of you probably, are now atheists regarding those gods. Just, the only difference is it's just one that we may disagree about. But 999, we all agree, have been thrown out. And the reason they've been thrown out is they've been buried by the rise of our physical understanding. Science works. And the fact that science works has buried the gods of the wind and the sun and the moon. Farmers now, as I was just saying, when it, when it doesn't rain, they don't pray for rain anymore. They go see a meteorologist. And that's a good thing. In the process, the human condition has improved immensely, and it will continue to improve as science continues to bury the one remaining God. Now, this one God is supposedly left. We might ask a priori or in advance, how, how likely is in advance that, that all those other 999 gods were false, but this one's true? Well, you might argue if you had a flat prior that it's probably a pretty small likelihood. But it doesn't really matter. The point is that our current understanding of nature has changed. We've learned things. It's changed and developed since the claims were made by Iron Age peasants who didn't even know the Earth orbited the Sun. And therefore, it's natural that science is inconsistent with those claims based on ignorance. And we shouldn't revere those ancient claims as sacred. They're ignorant. There's still many open questions. I'll try my one, my ten seconds of humility. It'll be the only time tonight. There's a lot we don't know about the universe, a lot more we don't know than we do. That's the wonder of science, that's why I'm a scientist. But it is intellectually lazy to just stop asking questions and stop looking for physical explanations and just say God did it. Oh.
this new age quantum crap. What yeah. The bleep do we know in Deepak Chopra? Yeah, what the bleep do you know in Deepak? Who, Deepak, yeah. yeah. I gave him a prize. When I used to write a column for Scientific American, I gave, him a, I gave a prize that, to the biggest p abusers of science. And um, so, yes, the problem with quantum mechanics is because it's so weird, con artists can use it. It's this spooky action at a distance that Einstein hated so much. It's only spooky because we insist that our classical worldview is sensible. That we have to have an interpretation of quantum mechanics. But as my late friend Sidney Coleman, who's a professor at Harvard, used to say, we should talk about the interpretation of classical mechanics. Because the world we see is just a classical approximation of the real world. And therefore, we would, shouldn't expect we're seeing the shadow of reality. We shouldn't expect the shadows to behave sensibly. It's the underlying reality. And if our sense of common sense, and if you watch our new movie, you'll see Richard and I are having a discussion in Australia, and, and, and he points out that common sense arose because we developed them on the, in Africa to avoid you know, lions, not to understand quantum mechanics. So if our common sense is violated, it's only a property of the fact that we are classical beings. And we shouldn't be offended if our common sense is violated because it's got nothing to do with the underlying reality. That's the great thing about science, which you can call atheism if you wish. It's you're willing to change your beliefs. You're not assuming the answers before you ask the question. You're not assuming you know what's divinely right just because you interpret a certain book to mean a certain thing and someone else may interpret it to mean something else. You will agree there are different interpretations of every book including the Bible and the Koran. And so you, to presume that you know divine truth before you've asked the universe is not sensible. I would say morality is impossible without science. That's the point. Because, and, and religion is an example, as I, can't, as I say, I can't think of a more immoral document than the Old Testament. But, but the, the point is, if you don't know the consequences of your actions, then you can't even decide what's right and wrong. And so, to, to, to take, to make, the, and so we have seen people's morality, if you want to call it morality, change. Slavery might have been okay because you might have believed that certain groups were inferior or not human. Science has told us that's wrong. You might have believed, as almost all religions do, that women are chattel. Science has told us that's wrong. You might have believed that homosexuality is evil. But science has told us that all mammalian species have homosexuality. That's, there's nothing in unnatural or evil about it. So to, to have a morality without science is empty. No, it's not sacred. We hold the scientific method in high regard because it works. If it stopped working, we'd throw it out. I think what we hold, we don't hold anything sacred, but we're utilitarians to, if, to be a philosopher for a moment. Uh, if, if, if it doesn't work, it doesn't, it, we, we don't care about it. If it works, we use it. You can call that sacred, but, um, but we only use what works. And the scientific method works. Revelation doesn't work. Get over it. And, and the, the point is that I, what my science is a human cultural activity. And in fact, if you read my writing, you'll see that I say the worth of science, in my opinion, is not from the technology. Well, we tend to love its technology, which has made the world a happier, healthier place for most people. But it's the fact that like art and music and literature, it forces us to reassess our place in the cosmos. It, it, it opens our eyes to the world. And art and music and literature do that, but so does science. And there's no sense in which science reduces the value of art, music, and literature. As, 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 and in fact, the most famous example I know of in that regard is from Richard Feynman, I wrote a book about, who said that a rainbow isn't any less beautiful because you understand how it's caused, it's much more beautiful. When you understand the amazing things that are happening, in fact, it's much more exciting. Uh, here's a recent one. For example, 60% of US adults surveyed in April 2007 stated their belief that God created humans in their present form less than 10,000 years ago. 60% of American adults, in spite of the fact that that is false. It's not arguable. There's no debate. It's nonsense. Most times in science, one side is just wrong. And that, that's really important. Because if that weren't the case, if one side wasn't unambiguously wrong, we couldn't make progress. In fact, that's what science is all about. Science can never prove anything to be right. It can only prove things to be wrong. And the great thing is, once they're wrong, we throw them out. 
We don't have to talk about them anymore. We don't need creative thinking classes to discuss whether the Earth is flat or to debate that issue or whether the Earth is 6,000 years old or any of the other things that we know to be wrong. And that is the way science makes progress. I think what you said is correct. You found, you found a way to find an ethical theory that makes those two apparently inconsistent things consistent. Okay? Yeah, right. And I think, and I've had a lot of discussions on stage and off stage with various theologians whose job is to do just that, to find ways to resolve apparent inconsistencies, to find eth ethical solutions that validate their belief. But that is what's wrong because the point of science and the reason it works is you don't just try and prove something you like to be true, you also try and prove it to be false. And that's what's really important. You don't just find yeah. a way to yeah. say the rainbows are caused by this or that. You actually try and see if your ideas are wrong and ask what's more plausible and based on evidence and, and inquiry what's more plausible. So what I find problematic is that the effort to find a rational excuse for something can work. But that doesn't make it right. You know, I get letters every day that I never got before. And those letters are from kids around the world and also from people in small towns who tell me, and I'm just so happy I saw this or I saw The Unbelievers or I read your book, because I realize I'm not a bad person for asking these questions. I'm not evil. And that is, to me, something I really hadn't appreciated before, that religion has usurped this notion of morality. So that if you just say, just saying, you know, I don't buy it, automatically is equivalent to the saying, I'm not a good person. And that, to me, is the underlying most immoral aspect of religion. It, is, is it, it tries to have a monopoly on morality and ethics. What it does is it, is it makes people feel guilty for thinking for themselves. And I can attest to that from just the, the, the vast and uh, every single day. I'm amazed at that. And, and I hadn't appreciated that as a as an evil before I, I actually started getting labeled and then people wrote to me. So they did a further study and they questioned people who were, who were uh, claimed the Christian box. They said, do you believe in the virgin birth? Do you believe in transubstantiation? Do you believe in this? No, 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 no. Why do you call yourself Christian? Because I like to think of myself as a good person. And I think most people call themselves Christians because they think if they don't, they're, they're, they'll be labeled as bad people. And when it comes to the origin of the universe, we are coming remarkably close to the realization that you don't need any miracle for that either. And that's because our knowledge of the universe is changing, not because we want to get rid of God, but because the more we learn, the less we need anything outside of the laws of physics and chemistry and biology. But it's good because science does more than that. It just doesn't just tell us about the world. It makes the world a better place. It gets rid of the vile, awful, immoral, works like the Bible. The worldview that I would argue is guides most of you in this room today, including those of you people of faith, which I assume is some fraction of the people in this audience. <laughs> those spiritual values of any educated person today are largely the worldview given us by science. You, your worldview is vastly different than it would have been four centuries ago. By stripping ecclesiastical authority of its credibility on factual matters, which we've certainly done, we cast out on its claims to certainty in matters of morality, which is great.